Tonight, you're going to hear a very peculiar story about how big oil funded climate change. But not the story that you're used to. This is another story. Um, first, some uh, things about myself. Uh, I have a PhD in science and technology studies from Linköping University. Uh, I'm also a geographer, and that's the kind of uh, science of everything. Uh, I have a, a master in culture and media production. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer and also a musician. <clears throat> and this is things that I combine. I have um, written four books. Uh, the first one was my uh, doctoral thesis, written in 2012, called Ordo Up Cow, uh, about the political history of biofuels in the European Union. Uh, and as I am a musician, uh, I thought, have anyone published a doctoral thesis with a soundtrack? I guess probably, or maybe not. Uh, so I decided I had to, to actually do that. I had a band at the time. So to my um, doctor thesis, I have a soundtrack uh, with uh, songs about the content. So I have kind of combined science with uh, my musical work. The second book I wrote was called Doom and Dogs Klockan or The Doomsday Clock. Uh, I wrote this uh, together with a uh, Finnish uh, journalist, Sven Olof Karlsson, uh, and an, uh, a Swedish uh, economist uh, called Marian Radetzky. Um, and um, in this book I, I wrote about uh, uh, actually how the climate issue uh, had evolved. I had uh, also written about it in my, my doctoral thesis. Um, and um, when I started to investigate this, I found out about one name. Um, but it was kind of surprising to find that name. Uh, because, um, yeah, as you may know <laughs> about this lecture, it, it was the Rockefellers. Um, one day when I started to investigate this, I, I uh, went into one of my colleagues uh, I was at the Climate Policy Center in Norrköping. Uh, and uh, because I wanted some background, as I, as I wrote about biofuels, I wanted to know why do we... Uh, uh, what is the motivation for this biofuel boom? And climate change was one of those reasons. Um, so I asked him, why... Um, um, have you any idea of how this uh, uh, issue evolved and um, from where? And he said to me, no, uh, I just know about this uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change. And, and I mean, the, the years just previous and afterwards, but not the long story. I have no idea, but I have, I have some papers here uh, that you can uh, look into. Uh, and I, I, I look into that, that paper and uh, uh, that got... got kind of strange because it was a couple of meetings in the 80s that were the foundation for the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. And uh, one of the sponsors were the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And that fi I found very strange. I mean, this is the Rockefeller is the oil fam family, number one. Uh, and um, I wrote about this in, in the, my thesis and also in Domedog's Klockan. And uh, in this new book, I tried to... I wanted really to dig into it and uh, understand uh, what was behind this. Uh, and also, like in the... Uh, with my doctoral thesis, I also made a soundtrack for, for this book as well. Um, the Rockefellers one. Some years after this, I mean, the year after Domedagsklockan was released, uh, the Rockefellers 
uh, went out and I mean they weren't just behind this uh, uh, science and uh, supporting uh, this science and 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 uh, IPCC. They they actually said that now is the time to divest um, from the oil that made them rich, uh, and uh, it was very very <laughs> peculiar. Uh, and this quote that you can read, I can read it for you. For a fund that is so devoted to fighting climate change and helping to prevent climate catastrophe, to continue to be invested in fossil fuels that are actually causing climate change just was morally hypocritical and unacceptable. Uh, I mean, what are their motivations? Why have the heirs to the standard oil for, uh, fortune attacked their own business? And why have the Rockefellers funded climate change research since the 1950s, helped shape climate policy measures since the 1980s, and supported climate activism since the 1990s? Um, it really blew my mind. Why? Uh, I mean, if you go back to history, um, the Standard Oil, the Standard Oil um, fortune, the Standard Oil Trust. I mean, the Rockefellers were the ones that actually made the world more or less dependent on oil. Uh, and we see in this uh, uh, picture, um, John D. Rockefeller, like an octopus, um, reaching out to control all of the, all the globe uh, with his tentacles. Uh, they control more or less uh, a major part of the oil business uh, in the late uh, 19th century and, uh, as, and uh, in the 20, 20th century as well. And John D. Rockefeller became the wealthiest man in the world, all because of the oil. So it's very, very strange that uh, a family would attack their core business. John D. Rockefeller said one in one famous quote, good leadership consists in showing average people how to do the work of superior people. And that is something what we're going to talk about. John D. Rockefeller, he had two holy books. The first thing, he was a religious man. He was a Baptist. He read the Bible every day. It was very important for him. Uh, he had inherited the, those traits from his uh, mother. That was a devoted Christian. Uh, so he took these words uh, it was very uh, important for, for him to give something to the world. But he also wanted to gain things. And the other thing, the other holy book, uh, was his ledger. John D. Rockefeller started as a book accountant. So he loved counting money that went in. And he protected this, he had this holy Bible and his ledger. And a ledger, he, he had a like, more like a relic. And uh, the practice of counting money, uh, he gave to his children. Uh, everything would be counted. He loved money more than anything else. Uh, but he, he made it, made the money, but he thought he had the protection from God to do it. Uh, and all this money went into the bank. Uh, he created, together with his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., uh, 
uh, what became the Chase Manhattan Bank, a bank uh, worldwide uh, in its scope. It was known as the Oil Bank. And uh, John D. Rockefeller's grandson, David Rockefeller, was heading uh, the Chase Manhattan Bank. And these things, the oil and the money, made the family able to do things. Uh, because they just didn't want to only to, to collect the money. They wanted to do something with it. They wanted to control the game. Controlling the game. Uh, and one thing, of course, was the natural resources and energy. That was what everything started with. Uh, another thing was population or human capital. Humans. Humans is important. Education and research uh, is another, uh, and the agriculture. They were behind the Green Revolution. Culture and media. Business and economy, of course, uh, that goes through everything. Uh, technology. We will come to that. That's an important part. Religion and evolution. And the last thing. Global politics and planning. Um, what was in mind from, from, uh, for the Rockefellers was they wanted to uh, standard oil was of a perfect business. Uh, and it was built on efficiency. And their vision was an efficient world. We can do the world better. And uh, one goal they had. This quote is from um, the Special Studies Project from the 1950s. A new international order. Uh, in this, I quote, they said, We cannot escape and indeed should welcome the task which history has imposed on us. This is the task of helping to shape a new world order in all its dimensions, spiritual, economic, political and social. As a with religion with them. They had a vision, a new Eden, uh, or a technological perfection of mankind and the world. They weren't alone on this. This was a project that they shared together with elites in the uh, United States and Britain, and some other parts as well. Methodology. To achieve this Eden, their own Eden, they have used Hegelian tactics, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Uh, or one could say, like Noam Chomsky says, uh, problem, reaction, solution. Uh, in order to get the society you want, you have to be on both sides all the time. Uh, you have to control the dichotomies, left and right, and play with left and right to get to what you want. Uh, and one more thing is to control the policy cycle, control politics. <clears throat> the, 
This is from a theory of Peter Vincemius uh, and a book called Beyond Interdependence, written for Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission in 1991. Uh, this book is how to control politics and to achieve what you want. Uh, a kind of a handbook. Uh, number one you have to do. Recognition of a problem. And as we're going to talk about climate today. A potential environmental problem is acknowledged, often led by think tanks. Activists draw public attention to the problem, this in some cases followed by a trigger event that spurs direct action. Policy form formulation. A debate starts about how to solve the issue. Environmentalists think that proposals are too weak and late, while business interests lobby try to delay the game. In the end, an agreement is reached. Implementation. The legislation is implemented, NGOs draw attention to non-compliance or neglect. And last, control. The environmental problem has been sold and put under control. And as we have both thesis and antithesis, controlling the opposition. Here are some examples on, on uh, uh, opposition that has been included uh, and more or less co-opted in, uh, in the Rockefeller sphere. We have Margaret Sanger with population issues. She hated the Rockefellers before, uh, in um, like 10 years before they gave, gave her money. Um, she was very harsh against them. She, she called them the most evil and ruthless family in the world, more or less. Uh, but later, the joint forces. Jane Jacobs, uh, a very important uh, figure in city planning and, and a critic to the treatment on cities uh, especially in the United States, when they t tore down all the old city centers in the States. She didn't like the Rockefellers because the Rockefellers were the ones that actually had huge projects, in, especially in New York, but they tear down uh, old neighborhoods. Uh, but late, they gave her money for studies. Rachel Carson, many knew about Rachel Carson. She was the one that more or less uh, started the uh, environmentalism in uh, the 60s and, and the more popular environmentalism. Uh, she talked about DDT, she talked about pesticides and, 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 uh, and, and the things that uh, pollutes from the fossil fuel industry. She got money from the Rockefellers as well. And last, Naomi Klein, very well known today as a climate activist. She talked about uh, how the Rockefellers and especially their henchman Kissinger uh, started the neoliberal wave in the 70s and, and corrupted Latin America and uh, overthrow uh, democratically elected leaders and uh, uh, instead supported Pinochet and uh, these dictatorships. Now, she also got money from the Rockefellers. How do they do it? Controlling research and education. This is a very key thing. Uh, one of the first things that the Rockefellers did, or John D. Rockefeller, uh, it was the uh, founding of the University of Chicago in 1890, because he knew one thing, because uh, with, um, with a university, you bring in all the great knowledge, all great minds, and you can do these things with this, and they did. 
Uh, University of Chicago, where we had the Manhattan Project was one of the major one of the major centers was was the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago, we also find the doomsday clock that always ticking for doom. And the Chicago School of Economics, the neoliberals, the neoconservatives, a lot of schools come from the University of Chicago. And in New York, the Rockefeller University. This is a medical uh, university, medicine. Uh, and also population issues. And this has ve been very important for, for the Rockefellers uh, with the health issues. Controlling culture and media. Uh, that was one of the important things that uh, they talked about uh, a lot after. The Rockefellers were so hated in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. We were despised, seen as evil, ruthless. So they decided they had to do something about it. They have to create a better image for the family. So they bought the newspapers and they also supported uh, journalism because John D. Rockefeller didn't want anyone to talk anything bad about him ever again. Controlling fear. This is supportive. Controlling fear. One thing to achieve uh, change in the world. You have to keep people in fear. Because that will be much easier to control and get them where you want them. This is a quote from... Uh, Eugene Rabinovich, um, he was the editor of a bulletin of atomic scientists. He, he had been all involved in the Manhattan Project at the University of Chicago. He said, if a world government causes a triumph, it will need more than a sympathetic endorsement by the majority. People must be made to feel that their own security, freedom and prosperity Yes, their very own survival depend on the creation in our time of a world rule of law. Yes. World governance and how to achieve this. What have the means been? One major thing, philanthropy. The Rockefeller started uh, philanthropic uh, endeavors in the late uh, 19th century. And they started a foundation called the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913. <clears throat> Their mission was to promote the well being of humanity throughout the world. And it was led by John D. Rockefeller's son, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And they said, this going to, we're going to have this foundation at, and it will function the same way as Standard Oil. But with giving to the world. Or more, I would say, changing the world. Rockefeller Foundation support a lot of uh, research and universities that has been important in uh, the climate change issue. Next thing, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Rockefeller uh, Jr., John D. Rockefeller Jr., he got five sons uh, that got famous and well known. Um, the first was John D. Rockefeller III. The second was Nelson. The third, Lawrence. The fourth, Winthrop. And the last one was David. 
they started with their own foundation uh, in 1940. And their mission has been to advance social change that contributes to a more just, sustainable and peaceful world. Uh, and they went into areas uh, all over the world. Uh, they more or less divided the world between them. Uh, John was into Asia and population issues. Nelson took Latin America and also politics. He wanted to be the president of the United States. Lawrence, he was into environmental issues or conservation. And more or less was uh, involved very much in America uh, and Europe as well. David, I will mention Winthrop lost one, for <laughs> one reason. David, he was all over the world, a banker, everywhere, in the Middle East, in Europe, and yeah, he was very, uh, very high profile. And he was uh, treated like a statesman. Um, had an airplane that he could flow to Moscow if he wanted. And, and was treated like a king when he came there. Uh, the last one, Winthrop. Uh, the other brothers, they thought, ah, uh, Winthrop, uh, ah. He can get uh, Arkansas. But it was, uh, he was a governor in Arkansas. But he never want, went into the world and tried to change uh, anything. But the other brothers were all over the globe. And they have used another tool as well. Because these brothers and the fathers as well uh, started a lot of organizations, influential organizations, big organizations, uh, that has had a huge influence on events in the world after, especially the Second World War. One of them was the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. This wasn't created directly by the Rockefellers. It was created, but they were among one of the founders. But among elite interests in the United States, the Council on Foreign Relations was a sister institute to the London Royal Institute in International Affairs. And this organization has uh, promoted the idea to, that we need uh, world govern governance uh, to solve international global problems. Uh, and they have uh, been very influential in some things, especially uh, among the members, of course, we, ha we have a, a lot of Secretary of State and uh, security advisors and important people uh, from the uh, administration or the, I mean, the president administrations in the United States. But they were also involved in another project or two projects. The first one uh, was the League of Nations. Uh, but especially the League of Nations was uh, very promoted by the Rockefellers, but the United States actually have never uh, went into the organization. It was blocked. So, uh, but they wanted, they, they liked the idea of an international organization to, to, to work with uh, uh, global problems all over the world. Uh, so, the Council on Foreign Relations, they actually made a study uh, in the late 30s but came up with the idea of creating the United Nations. Uh, the Rockefellers have been hugely supportive of, of the United Nations, very supportive. Uh, here's a quote from Ban Ki-moon. Um, he was the, uh, the, the UN General Secretary before the, uh, Antonio Guterres, that's the previous one. Um, 
Ban Ki-moon said, I am deeply grateful to the esteemed members of the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller Foundation for continuing the noble tradition of supporting international organizations devoted to peace. Uh, and actually, this um, building, the UN headquarters, it has, hadn't been for the... Uh, it, it was the Rockefellers that actually donated the land where the uh, UN headquarters are. And uh, they also commissioned uh, the, the group of architects uh, that made these drawings to this project. In the, from their perspective, perfect international style of architecture. <clears throat> Another infamous organization uh, that they have been all involved in uh, concerning uh, international cooperation is the Bilderberg Group. Um, a long time it was very secretive. Uh, now we actually um, one can row, uh, write uh, or can read about what they uh, discuss on, on their meetings, uh, but only the topics, not what they actually say or do at the meetings. Uh, WIS was founded by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands in, the, uh, in 1954. And David Rockefeller uh, was also uh, in the steering committee early on. Um, and it was for elite interests from Europe and the United States. Uh, but if we discuss the climate issue, uh, the Club of Rome is one of the major organizations or think tanks. The Club of Rome was uh, founded in 1968 and it was one of the, the, the most important meetings was at the Bellagio Center at the Rockefeller Foundation. And behind this organization we also find Gianni Anelli, uh, the boss of Fiat and uh, a good friend of David Rockefeller. Uh, industrialist, and uh, it was headed by Aurelio Pecce, uh, the second man at Fiat, uh, and also one of the founders of Alitalia. And I mean, it's very interesting. This is a, uh, one of the major um, environmental think tanks, and there were industrialists behind this uh, that actually worked with uh, the auto industry and. Uh, also oil <laughs> as well. Uh, their mission was to promote understanding, or is, their mission is, is to promote understanding of the global challenges facing humanity and to propose solutions through scientific analysis, communication and advocacy. Uh, and another very, very important organization is the Trilateral Commission founded in 1973 uh, and this was an uh, we can say an offshoot of the Bilderberg group uh, the the trilateral commission the idea was to to take the brightest minds in the United States in Europe and Japan to start to cooperate about global issues and uh, find come up with uh, solutions. And this has been a very important vehicle, uh, especially regarding how climate policy has evolved. Um, founder was David Rockefeller, and we also find Spigny Beshinsky, who was uh, an American security advisor uh, uh, to uh, Jimmy Carter in the 70s, and he has been a scientific uh, or a uh, uh, geopolitical advisor after that as well to admi uh, certain administrations, often to the Democratic Party. That was organizations. Now we come to the policy life cycle. Recognition of the problem. Uh, what was the problem?
that the Rockefeller brothers uh, talked about. Uh, one of the brothers, Lawrence, he was into uh, conservation efforts and natural resources. Um, we saw problems with um, too many people. Uh, and how can we uh, better use our resources? And uh, they said, we need some kind of global planning of the resources. Uh, and they supported um, uh, world government ideas. Uh, and the uh, ideology was Malthusian. Um, that meant that um, money, uh, uh, food supplies uh, can't meet the demand of a growing population. Uh, and the modern environmental discourse uh, was kind of born with uh, those involved uh, together with Lawrence in, in the Conservation Foundation, founded in 1948. Uh, with Fairfield Osborne Jr. as uh, president and chairman. Um, <clears throat> he wrote a book uh, called Our Planet Planet. Um, but, and the um, uh, conclusions were later echoed in, in reports by the Club of Rome. Uh, but this spurred a debate in the 50s about population. Uh, the other brother, um, one of the other brothers, John D. Rockefeller III, he was very much into to population and population control. If you have, uh, you have too many uh, people in the world, this is a problem. How shall we manage this? Uh, Population Council uh, that he founded, they um, started planning for a, a global plan for uh, population control um, to reduce fertility uh, and also ideas of relocate uh, populations in the world uh, in order to bring down the population, the population bomb, the population problem. Uh, and the funny thing with this, I mean, why did we have this population explosion? Um, it was for fossil fuel, oil. So more or less the Rockefellers created this problem in the beginning and and what they did uh, after this was I mean um, the solutions at this time was about um, uh, uh, fertility reducing measures uh, sterilization and uh, uh, contraceptives and and but all these things were uh, were gaining I mean it was a very good for their business because they could sell the solutions to this. So they had this problem, but they also had the solutions to it. And also we have the Green Revolution. Uh, but they said it's a problem with this fossil fuel thing, <laughs> but <laughs> we, uh, they changed the, um, I mean, agriculture revolution, but so that we used even more fossil fuels. Not less. Um, but one thing that ties together this also is that almost everyone involved in Population Council and Conservation Foundation, they were into something. Um, that wasn't, I mean, it had a very bad reputation after the Second World War. And that was eugenics. Um, The president of uh, the Population Council, later on, after John D. the Third, was Frederick Osborne. He was also um, 
the president of the American Eugenic Society. And their idea was to create a better man and to... Uh, they didn't, didn't want this, one could say, useless eaters. Uh, something that um, Henry Kissinger later was uh, famous to have said. Uh, and at this time, something was combined. An idea was formed for what was, could combine the population, natural resources, and the scare of this into something. Um, climate change. In 1955, uh, this is uh, a quote from John von Neumann. He's, he's a very famous mathematician or was, at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, one of the most famous institutes in the in, uh, United States. Uh, only top scientists were there. He said this in 1955. Intervention in atmospheric and climatic matters will unfold on a scale difficult to imagine at present. This will merge each nation's affairs with those of every other more thoroughly than the threat of a nuclear or any other war would have done. Very prophetic of him in 1955. Uh, climate became an issue in the 50s. Uh, and it was much because of uh, the Amer American military um, had large funds to use to, I mean, military was interested in uh, climate and weather. It's important in war to know uh, how, I mean, we have uh, examples with that. A Swedish example, for example, <laughs> with uh, uh, when we, when we, I say we because I'm from Sweden, <laughs> uh, beat the, the Danes. Uh, in the sixth, uh, 17th century, uh, we had the eyes to walk over and take Copenhagen from behind. And that made the Swedish Empire happy for a while. But, so, weather and climate is important for the military. And at this time, they had also started to uh, come up with a computer. And, uh, they could calculate things. And one thing that they started to calculate was um, how carbon dioxide could uh, eventually um, uh, make uh, the weather or the climate change. Um, the climate models that we use today uh, have a, a long background and, and, and a history, and it comes from, from the 50s. And <clears throat> one of the scientists that were uh, around at the founding of Population Council, it was called Roger Revelle. Um, and he was, became interested in the carbon dioxide issue. Svante Arrhenius' old theory. And he became uh, one of the major uh, promoters of his theory in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and we also have Carl Gustav Rosby, um, but was uh, educated at, uh, I mean, he, he was in the United States, and uh, he built up um, uh, meteorology at the University of Chicago. And the Rockefeller uh, funded institute, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And we also have a, another scientist called Walter, Walter O. Roberts, uh, but also very important in the 60s and 70s, uh, talking about how carbon dioxide can change things. Uh, this, with changing things, was, uh, of course, very interesting for those people that actually funded this. 
The Rockefeller Brothers Fund in 19, the late 1950s wrote a report called the Special Studies Project. It was a very, very ambitious work. Uh, they, uh, they had every, more or less every smart uh, <clears throat> man, I would say. I, I, th I think it's only were male, <laughs> uh, males involved in this report. Uh, but the smartest guys they could bring in the United States uh, to discuss problems, global problems, and how to solve them, these problems, uh, and issues that would be important for the United States in the 60s and 70s. And uh, it was more, actually, this was Nelson Rockefeller's project because he wanted to be the president of the United States. Uh, and this was kind of a manual for the coming president administrations. Uh, Nelson wanted to, to take care of that himself, but he never got that far. He became a vice president. Uh, but the one who actually headed the project was uh, the Rockefellers. Uh, one of their most important uh, figures that had been cooperating with them uh, ever since, Henry Kissinger. He was leading this uh, uh, project in the beginning. And they said, they had a chapter about the climate, where they said, if it becomes possible to interfere actively in the big processes with the atmosphere, the results are likely to transcend national boundaries. The problems that will then arise must be handled on an international basis. This is repeated all over, all, all over the time when, you, uh, uh, when I've studied uh, their papers and, and uh, uh, annual reports and everything. Always this. This has to be handled on an international level, these problems. Because this has been defined as the perfect problem. This is from uh, an annual report in as late as 2005. <clears throat> Whatever Rockefeller Brothers son say, the warning of the climate is no longer merely or primarily an environmental issue. It is an energy issue, a business issue, an investor issue, a moral issue, a security issue, an agricultural issue, a coastal issue, a religious issue, an urban issue. In short, a global issue that touches every conceivable facet of human existence. It is a matter of universal concern that cuts across party lines, religious affiliations, class divisions, and demographic distinctions. And, they say, therein lies our current opportunity. They said that in 2005. And here's a shot of uh, funding of climate change ever since the 50s. The very rich oil family behind ExxonMobil and the funding of climate research and climate activism since the late 1950s. And I, would me I will mention some of this. In 1965, the climate first uh, was discussed at the presidential level in the United States. It was President Lyndon Johnson. And remember now, this special studies project was a kind of a handbook for the president at that time. Um, Lyndon Johnson, he said in a speech, this generation has altered the composition of atmosphere on a global scale through radioactive materials and a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. The one behind this report that uh, wrote the chapter about carbon dioxide and, and climate matters was Roger Revelle. Roger Revelle that was present on the first population council meeting on uh, the discussion on a global plan to curb population growth. 
The second thing, Lawrence. Lawrence Rockefeller was a, a very, very good friend of Lady Bird Johnson, uh, the president's wife. And he was on almost every commission on, on environment um, in the 50s and 60s. And he was involved in this speech that the president gave. In 1971, uh, this is uh, before the Stockholm Conference on the Environment, the United Nations Conference. Uh, they did two studies about climate before that meeting. Um, the one was responsible for this uh, was Carol Louis Wilson. Carol Louis Wilson. Uh, was a personal friend of Nelson Rockefeller and had even been involved in this special studies project in, uh, in the late 50s. Uh, he was in the steering committee of the Club of Rome and he became a member of the Trilateral Commission and he was also together with uh, David Rock Rockefeller, a director of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they had a, actually a conference about this in uh, week outside Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, and uh, the Royal Academy of Sciences was involved with this. Uh, and this report was very important because it take, took every aspect of how uh, humans can uh, actually intervene in the climatic systems. Um, and uh, carbon dioxide was just one of the problems. Uh, another was um, uh, how the release of aerosols in the atmosphere could block the sun and uh, make the, the climate uh, become colder instead. But the thing uh, with this report was that it was humans that caused this. It was human intervention. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that uh, Club of Rome later said that this was kind of a, their problem that they had searched for. Uh, this is a very famous quote, I would say. I don't know if every, everybody here has seen it, but uh, this is from a Club of Rome report from 1991. And it says, in searching for a common enemy against whom we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. In their totality and their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which must be confronted by everyone together. The real enemy is humanity itself. Um, most people think that, uh, if you talk to young people today, I mean, they, they think, I mean, it was the environmentalist movement that created this and, and, uh, and uh, they made uh, companies think about what we did and everything. And uh, It's not kind of that case. Uh, if we uh, talk about the radical environmentalists. Uh, that movement more or less uh, became ra radicalized in 1970. Uh, they arranged something that called the Earth Day. And in this, they took all these uh, problems that had been discussed in the 50s and 60s, especially about population matters. Um, we can see in this uh, picture uh, how they uh, demonstrates and, and, and uh, about uh, population issues. Uh, this wasn't entirely a grassroots movement. The thing is, we both uh, we mentioned Friends of the Earth here. Uh, Friends of the Earth and Earth Day was actually had got money from a guy called Robert O. Anderson. He was a friend of. 
David Rockefeller sat on the board of Chase Manhattan. He was an operator of an oil company, Atlantic Ritual Corporation. Uh, and um, he has been, um, it's, it's a very interesting book uh, that has been uh, written about him, uh, called Oil Man Environmentalist and his leading role in the international environmentalist movement. And it's very funny because uh, he first talks about drilling for oil. And uh, he was in Texas. I mean, you can see his uh, uh, <laughs> typical <laughs> uh, Texan hat. And um, he cheated and, and he said, oh, I love this drilling for oil. That's the thing that I love. And the next chapter, He's uh, at the Stockholm conference and talking about environment and he, he tells about everybody about, oh, I was one of the first that talked about global warming and yeah, got, got environmental prices. And the next chapter, he's, um, 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 he's standing with a, a big, big ship that ships oil and uh, yeah, um, brags about the oil again. And, and in the last chapter, he... Uh, uh, it, it, it's when, when he has done all these environmentalist things, uh, what do, does he do? He uh, starts a new oil business in Texas uh, for the last days of his life. So, I mean, we, we can say, I mean, they create, <laughs> they're not lying uh, when we say that uh, uh, the, the humans and, but they, they, <laughs> the humans were them, <laughs> actually. Uh, in 1972, the big environmental meeting in Stockholm, uh, the conference Only One Earth. Uh, this was one of the biggest uh, uh, conferences that the UN had had, uh, and, and very influential for, for the environmental agenda. The man behind it, or the general secretary, of the, of the conference was Maury Strong. Um, Maury Strong was a friend of the Rockefeller family. Um, he was on the board of Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, he was uh, in the Club of Rome and became a member of the Trilateral Commission. Um, it was a very, very, uh, a lot of uh, Rockefeller involvement in, in uh, that conference. In 1973, I mean, the Stockholm conference, they had talked about these environmental issues, all these problems that the, our uh, civilization had created, uh, or maybe the civilization that the oil man had created for us. But it was all our fault. In 1973, it came a trigger event that highlighted all the problems that had been uh, uh, discussed in the 50s, 60s, and the early 70s. The first oil crisis. Uh, and this was a major blow for the, for the Western economy. It created huge problems. Uh, but this... Uh, the problem wasn't a really, really shortage of oil. It was actually uh, a political crisis. Uh, and it was because of the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War uh, between the Arab states that suddenly attacked Israel. Um, Israel won this war uh, after a couple of days, but it, uh, it started a shock wave. And um, we had to do something. Something had to be done. Uh, the interesting thing with this, uh, if we go a couple of decades later, uh, one of the actors involved in this, Sheikh Ahmed Shaki Yamani from Saudi Arabia, he said, 
Hmm. This isn't the problem that we actually made. Uh, he said this, this is a quote. I'm 100% sure that the Americans were behind the increase in the price of oil. The oil companies were in real trouble at the times. We had borrowed a lot of money and they needed a high oil price to save them. King Faisal sent me to the Shah of Iran who said, why are you against the increase in the price of oil? That is what we want. Ask Henry Kissinger. He is the one who wants a higher price. Uh, and the thing is, they actually talked about uh, a possible energy crisis uh, the year before in, at the Aspen Institute in uh, USA. Uh, a report commissioned by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund uh, talked about this. And uh, it was also a, a, a discussion point at the Bilderberg meeting in uh, Saltsjöbörden in Sweden uh, some months before uh, the actual crisis happened. Next, poli poli policy formulation. We had the oil crisis. A debate starts about how to solve the issue. Total world planning. Uh, here's a quote by Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, he became the vice president of the United States uh, in uh, 19, late 1974. He said, I'm a great believer in planning. Economic, social, political, military, total world planning. Uh, a lot of things started. Uh, in the middle of, uh, of the 70s. Uh, Nelson, he was an opening speaker at the conference uh, that the White House uh, had commissioned with an uh, organization called the World Future Society. This is an organization with uh, uh, futurists, famous futurists in, in the United States, that uh, debated and talked about how can we create a future utopia. A future world uh, that is better than the one that we have today. Uh, uh, invited to this was uh, um, Erwin Laszlo from the Club of Rome. Um, and um, also uh, an important futurist called Barbara Marx Hubbard. She was a founding member of the World Future Society. And very important for the New Age movement later on. But this, in this context, they talked about the future society and how to create the perfect world. Uh, all of these things that had been discussed uh, came into this meeting. Um, and a lot of very important players uh, were at this conference um, and became members of the World Future Society. Uh, Erwin Laszlo wrote a report called Goals for Mankind commissioned by the, the Club of Rome. Uh, he said in this, this proposed new global system is highly interdependent, as in the same manner that the human body assigns different tasks to its various organs. Each region is assigned specialized and specific, and specific tasks, and is each is dependent on the others for their common survival. The interdependent system that we actually see today. We have an interdependent system. And he said one, uh, one other thing that must be mentioned. The resultant ideal sustainable population is hence more than 500 million, but less than 1 billion. Because population and sustainability was a big issue. And, uh, all these things that actually was uh, discussed at the Population Council in '52. Yeah. Laszlo had been an, an editor of a book that talked about this sustainable utopia. Uh, a plan, actually a plan for it. I have this book at home and it's very interesting. Uh, called Cosmic Humanism and World Unity by philosophy uh, Professor Oliver Reiser, 
uh, from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he talks in this book about creating something, a perfect society, and he uses religious language and talks about the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. A techno-spiritual utopia, because one of the things that they decided the future is was they had to combine science with religion. Uh, and that has a huge influence on, on the New Age movement that came after this. In the 1980s, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund started something called the One World Program. Uh, and here we talk about this interdependence. One World was a response to the global situation was, which the committee observed had become dangerously nationalistic, isolationistic, and heavily armed and destructive of natural resources. It recognized that nations had become economically and ecologically interdependent and resource deep consumption, environmental degradation and international security must therefore be addressed on a regional and global basis. Yeah, that's the same thing. It's a kind of a mantra. And they decided uh, that the time for climate action was now. We had to bring up the climate change to the international agenda. Uh, and they had two goals in the 80s. Distilling consensus on climate science. And number two, moving the discussion of climate change from the scientific community into the policy arena. And uh, the chairman of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund at this time was David Rockefeller. Uh, and also on the board was Henry Kissinger. So, uh, kind of the same people from the 50s. At the same time as the One World Program, uh, a similar uh, program or uh, initiative was uh, uh, unleashed. Uh, it was led by Gro Harlem Brundtland. Uh, she was uh, the Prime Minister of Norway. Um, and it talked about exactly the same things. Uh, they wrote a report called Our Common Future. Uh, and Gro Harlem Brundtland, she was a member of the Trilateral Commission, Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. Maurice Strong was also a member of this, um, has been, in, been involved in very, very much things. Uh, to this report, uh, Our Common Future, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund had one goal. They wanted the climate issue to be in the report. So they gave uh, money uh, for this to um, uh, the head of the Swedish Bayer Institute to include it in the, uh, the report. Um, they also had, I mean, it was trilateral <laughs> that headed this uh, project. Uh, and also the uh, the actual main author uh, was very in, uh, connected to, to the Rockefeller network. Um, so it was the easy to, to get into the, uh, uh, the climate issue uh, in the report. Uh, the year after Brundtland Commission report was released, the IPCC came about. And uh, this I talked about before. IPCC, um, uh, the founding uh, that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund had been uh, uh, kind of involved in this. Uh, the thing with this, this is uh, uh, an American uh, issue um, because Mustafa Tolba, uh, the head of the United Nations Environmental Program, he asked George Schultz. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State uh, for uh, for these organizations to be organized and uh, take, uh, I mean, create uh, what it should do, actually. So this was uh, the presidential administration of Ronald Reagan, <laughs> uh, that actually was behind uh, what became the IPCC. So they wrote uh, what it was supposed to, 
to work with. Uh, that was to analyze the scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change, its potential impacts and options for adaption and mitigation. Uh, just one year after, um, um, climate activists uh, started to talk about this. The thing at this time, climate wasn't a big thing uh, at the uh, uh, environmental movement. Uh, at this time, we had um, other issues. It was more, uh, uh, we had had Harrisburg and Chernobyl. Um, so, um, it was nuclear power that was seen as a problem. And a lot of environmentalists at this time, they, they said that this climate thing, it's more like a conspiracy of a nuclear industry because they want it, they say that it's needed because the climate problem is so much worse than any radi radiation. So they wanted to save uh, nuclear after uh, Chernobyl accident. Uh, but eventually, they started to talk about uh, climate as well. At the same time, uh, another coalition started, and it was the uh, oil companies that started something that's called the Global Climate Coalition. And here we see Exxon and uh, Arco, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, where we find people that actually was involved early on uh, in the climate issue. In 1991, uh, a report was released uh, by the Trilateral Commission called Beyond Interdependence. Uh, and now uh, we started to um, talk about a global action plan to achieve what was decided uh, in the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. And it said, climate change challenges old forms of government. International law and global institutions are needed. And uh, we have uh, both David Rockefeller and Morris Strong involved in this report. Uh, in 1992, uh, the Brundtland Commission was kind of a stepping stone to, to the UN uh, Rio conference. Well, it was the follow-up conference uh, to Stockholm. Uh, and this was a very, 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 very important meeting. Um, but it has shaped much of what we see today in environmental politics. Here uh, we have uh, the opening speech from Maurice Strong. He says, you are called upon to rise to your historic responsibility as custodians of a planet in taking the decisions here that will unite rich and poor, north, south, east and west in a new global partnership to ensure our common future. Uh, it's always the same global agenda, global problems that need to be solved. And this came in, a, in, in the document Agenda 21. Uh, some other thing that also came from this conference was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, that started yearly conferences uh, to... Um, negotiate about what to do about the climate. How can we uh, manage this problem? The ultimate objective of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic human-induced interference with the climate system. So, uh, and this was also a part of uh, this Beyond the Interdependence Report from the Trilateral Commission. Uh, after the meeting, it, uh, another thing was important because we started to talk about uh, this uh, new uh, future society and that they needed values. They needed principles for this uh, new sustainable future. So they started a, a commission, the Earth Charter Commission. Um, to discuss how, uh, what kind of values we should live under in the future. The interesting thing with this commission, it was that uh, behind this we see uh, Queen Beatrix of uh, 
in the Netherlands. Uh, she actually asked uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and Morris Strong to, um, to lead this. Uh, but um, the one that was actually one of the main architects was Stephen Rockefeller. Uh, and it was uh, actually, uh, he took, uh, he was, uh, uh, had, uh, had meetings on the Pocantico estate, that is the Rockefeller estate uh, outside of New York. And they had uh, the meetings there and, and he was the chairman holding it together. Uh, and they wrote uh, 16 principles for the future world. And Stephen Rockefeller was the son of Nelson Rockefeller uh, and uh, Queen Beatrix, uh, the daughter to Prince Bernard. So, uh, and, and one thing, we have a leader of uh, uh, Standard Oil, uh, Exxon family, and the leader of uh, the Shell Oil. Uh, Shell Oil is called the Royal Dutch Shell. So, the great, great oil families behind the Earth Charter. In 2001, they took the uh, Earth Charter, they wrote it down on papyrus, uh, and put it in this new uh, covenant, the Ark of Hope. Um, not very well known that they actually created this. Uh, but it's more, here we can see the biblical proportions of this. And more or less, new commandments for the world. We abandoned the, uh, the old ones and now we have this new earth religion. Um, and it's very funny to, to actually read about this Ark of Hope because it's claimed that uh, the handle is made of unicorn horns. So <laughs> I don't know what, where we have gotten them. <laughs> but And uh, the thing with this Ark of Hope, um, it was um, ready in 2001 and they had this uh, 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 meeting in uh, the 9th of... Uh, September 2001, and uh, everyone knows what happened the 11th. Um, this um, was, um, yeah, the two towers collapsed. And what we did, uh, this arc, it was in Vermont, um, it's uh, on the east coast of the uh, United States, and they decided to have a procession to walk with this um, for what had happened. And to, to talk about, I mean, it was to highlight this global problems, this global terrorism, everything. We need to cooperate and come together. So they, they carried this to, to uh, United Nations headquarters uh, and put it in, on display there. Uh, the following years, in 2002, Stephen Rockefeller, he started another, he gave seed money to another project that um, actually had some connections also to Sweden or, or the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Uh, it was a, uh, a plan for the world in the future, uh, the great transition, or one can say the great transformation uh, that's usually used today. Uh, the promise and lure of the times ahead. And here we can see a globe that is in pieces put together. And that's kind of a thing that we can see. Um, a world in problems, but we can put it together and make it better. In 2005, climate became, came up and became a major, major thing with Katrina especially in the United States. And with Katrina, the climate prophet arrived. Al Gore in 2006 and uh, his very, very famous movie, An Inconvenient Truth. 
Uh, Al Gore had been a member of, or is a member of the World Future Society, and very much into this um, futuristic solutions on, on, on the climate issue. He was also part of a think tank called the Congressional Institute for the Future. Uh, and uh, another organization called GLOBE, that one can read about in my book. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting to see these connections with uh, this futuristic thinking and the climate. In 2009, Henry Kissinger, he never dies. He lives, I, I don't know what, what he eats or what he's made of. Uh, I think he's like 95 now, somebody who knows. Um, he said in New York Times in 2009, this is a quote, the ultimate challenge is to shape the common concerns of most countries and all major ones regarding the economic crisis together with a common fear of jihadist terrorism into a common strategy reinforced by the realization that the new issues like pro pro proliferation, energy and climate change permit no national or regional solution. Mm, that's very familiar. It's kind of like from the special studies project in the 50s. Uh, and this he said in New York Times, talking about this new world order. Uh, some years later, we arranged a new meeting in, in, uh, in uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro, uh, called Rio Plus 20. 20 years after the first meeting, uh, it was called the future we want. Whose future? Who is we in we? The thing is that this motto came from meetings that was held at uh, the Contico estate at the Rockefeller's estate uh, outside New York. Uh, and they had a meeting with a lot of futurists and visionaries. And they wanted to, uh, because it was very depressing with all this talk about doomsday all the time. Uh, but everything runs out, everything gets bad. So they wanted to have a better, I mean, formulate it in another way. Uh, that made the poison taste more good one can say. And we had this meeting, decided on uh, how can we uh, create this future, and, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, went to uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon at the United Nations uh, and gave him a report. And, and Ban Ki-moon said, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, I love this motto. I think we should have it on the next UN conference on the environment. Um, he took a lot of ideas from it as well. In 2014, the People's Climate March in New York, uh, that was the same year that uh, the Rockefeller said, now we're going to divest from uh, the fossil fuel that made us stinkingly rich. Uh, and the thing is, they actually also funded the People's Climate March and more or less created the organization 350 org uh, that now are behind a lot of uh, climate uh, activism. Uh, in the world, and Naomi Klein is uh, a part of his organizations. Uh, the year after this, in 2015, not that it was talked about a lot, but it was the year that the global goals was decided the global goals for this future society. Uh, and, um, and it's goals that spans, uh, it 
uh, goes into everything, just like the quote uh, about the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the climate. It is in every issue in the world uh, that has to do with humans, environment, economy, everything. Uh, very important goals uh, for what we see today. And the same year, in 2015, the Great Paris Agreement was finally agreed. I mean, this was the United Framework Convention of Climate Change uh, that had arranged meetings for... This was meeting number 21. So it was a long, long nego negotiation to, to get uh, this to be achieved. Uh, environmentalists said that they, di they were disappointed with this. It was not binding. It was... Uh, 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 I mean, some polluters uh, would be allowed to, to build no uh, coal-powered power plants. And uh, they, they thought it was not a very good deal. But Rockefeller Brothers Fund, they loved it. They thought it was the best they could achieve. Because now they should uh, start to, to work on it and make it uh, give the UN more muscles, give more money to organizations to implement the legislation. And what was this all about? What was the implementation about? What was the solution to all these problems? It came just one month later. The fourth industrial revolution. Uh, at the Davos meeting, World Economic Forum in 2016. Klaus Schwab, the head of World Economic Forum, the chairman, uh, he had a new testament uh, with the big solutions. And he said in, at this meeting about the revolution, in its most pessimistic, dehumanized form, the fourth industrial revolution may indeed have the potential to robotize humanity and thus to deprive us of our heart and soul. Hmm? Does this sound like a good revolution for us? Here's the board of uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, World Economic Forum is extremely powerful. And we have all the leading banks from the world. Bank of England, Bank of America, Russian Spear Bank. And, uh, World Bank, IMF, and big corporations. Every big corporation in the world loves the economic forum and are part of it. They love this revolution. It creates money and opportunities. So what is this shape uh, for the industrial revolution? Two years later, uh, a new book was presented by Klaus Schwab, not written by him, by, but all the working groups of the World Economic Forum. And it had a very, one can say, I think, an extreme view of how to solve these uh, global issues. Number one, extending, extending digital technologies. That is Internet of Things. But everything should be connected to everything. Um, every device we have, and even humans. Reforming the physical world. Uh, and that this would be connected with an artificial intelligence. Taking care of everything. And robots. And number three. And this, you can t uh, think about the eugenic roots of uh, how this issue began. Altering the human being. They say this at this meeting, altering the human being. 
It sounds like more like Nazis, I would say. Altering the human being with bio and neurotechnology. And the last, integrating the environment with geoengineering and space technology. Okay, so now we have created problems and now we're going to uh, come with solutions and uh, make the globe to some uh, big uh, experiment with geoengineering. And who likes this? Here's another Swede. Um, he was at Stockholm University, just like me. Johan Ockström is a uh, very high, highly acclaimed. Now he's the, 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 the boss of the Potsdam Institute in Berlin. He says this, the fourth industrial revolution can lead us to a zero carbon future if we act now. And together with Christiana Figueres, she is the, was the head of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And also an old friend of the Rockefellers. Yeah. She said, or they said, with Davos 2018 as the launch pad, we will bring together a coalition of the leading tech companies to launch a disruptive roadmap in San Francisco to change the course of history. Our goal is to turn 10 million entrepreneurs and engineers and others working in the tech sector into planetary stewards. Whatever these great minds are working on, the stability and resilience of our climate for human regeneration must be the compass course. Hmm. Have we actually voted for this? Uh, this is a system. This is a new economic system that we actually are talking about uh, called technocracy. Technology will solve everything. And everything will be run by the engineers, the scientists, and the experts. Uh, and this came up at the G20 level. The G20 is another goal that came into fruition in 2008. A new global forum to change the world and to address these uh, emerging global issues that need to be solved. The G20 took this fourth industrial revolution and combined it with the global goals. The global goals that spans into everything. Uh, and this is about technology. All about technology. This year, World Economic Forum, this is uh, some examples. We connect technologies to every goal. Goal one, no poverty. AI enable digital footprint for credit mobile money access. Uh, this is actually a system of social credits. And we say this in this report. Social credits. And to create uh, obedience uh, by the citizens for the system. It's a very interesting report and it's uh, freely to download from the internet. Uh, and every, every goal is connecting to AI, AI and technology. That's the solution. Uh, and one thing one uh, should ask about this, how can this actually solve this problem that we talk about? How? Uh, we actually say that this system may have some problems. I mean, to build up all this technology, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, you have to start up a lot of coal plants, <laughs> powered plants, to, to actually achieve this. Uh, and all the minerals, all the resources you have to use. So it's a... Oh. Uh, when you start looking into it, it's, it's a, uh, almost feels diabolical, I would say. 
Global governance comes into this as well. And here we have Johan Rockström as well. Uh, he says, I cannot see any other way than 200 nations having to surrender some of their decision-making sovereignty to a global institutional administration. We have to work with the institutions we have, and there is only one institution, but it's global, the UN. Technological totalitarianism. Um, it has come warnings about this years before. Um, this is Dirk Helbing. He's the head of a research project called Futur ICT. Future ICT. Uh, he actually works with his technologies and has worked with uh, how to collect information from every citizen, every process, everything that's happening. And this is connected to um, a uh, European Union funded project. Uh, and he actually, I mean, he's working with this. And he says this. He warns about it. What have we created? A monster. It becomes increasingly evident that all the features of fascism have been implemented digitally or are currently being implemented. They could be used on a society-wide scale at any time. And the last thing, altering the human being. Are they out of their mind? Uh, James Lovelock says this, the man behind the Gaia theory, how to save the planet. If we somehow merge with our electronic creations in a larger scale endosymbiosis, it may provide a better next step in the evolution of humanity and Gaia. What? Is he talking about? Um, but some people, they take this very, very seriously. Here we have uh, a Swedish tech entrepreneur and a piercing guy called Johan Österlund. He has started a business called Biohacks. He's talking about the Internet of Us. And he has actually started to shipping people with microchip in their hands. Now we're talking biblical proportion as well. Uh, I think like two, two three thousand people in Sweden has, uh, have these uh, microchips uh, as for now. Um, and uh, we have had a lot of, uh, especially in the Nordic countries, I mean, there has been some conference here in Finland as well about this uh, with a biohacker movement. But talk about going together with the technology. Uh, and the most outrageous stuff comes from Elon Musk. Uh, with his talk about the Neuralink, uh, to actually put brain chip into people and connect us to the global database. Uh, I mean, this is science fiction, and they are talking about it. And, and Elon Musk, uh, I don't know where, what, he, what he has gotten all his money from, but it's invested in so much in these technologies now in a very, very high speed. Um, so what is all this about? The control, controlling the game. Um, and the thing is, to solve a problem, it's like we have created a problem. Assimilated. 
Is this the future we want? I say no. Um, and then that's one of uh, the reasons that I have... Uh, uh, I'm standing here today and talk about these things because very few do, very few understand this. Uh, and um, I think it's a responsibility if you know something about it. Uh, and uh, everything I have talked about is in my book. It's a scientific book. It's very, very well documented. Uh, it's... Uh, it may sound very outlandish, but I'm sorry to say that this is a true story. Uh, I have started a foundation called the Forest Foundation um, to speak out about this. And uh, now we are trying to build networks in the world uh, to, to warn about this uh, what I say, real threats against humanity. Uh, the solutions uh, on global climate change and uh, the environment. Uh, that seems so uh, counterproductive. Um, and you can go into my uh, foundation. Um, I have a website. Um, stiftersandfathers.org and uh, also a mail address. And um, one can also support me and our work with uh, buying uh, my book uh, that also comes with this soundtrack. Because I want to, I mean, this is serious, uh, this is serious talk, this is a serious future, but I uh, and the uh, Forest Foundation want to talk about uh, humanity and, and what's good with humanity and human creativity and, and, uh, 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 and the love of creating things. So, and I want to, to make things, we also, also talk about making a, a more beautiful world and, and actually do a change for real. That is... But it's a positive change uh, and come together and I mean we don't need all this technology uh, and and I can agree one thing as uh, we as a human family has to come together and cooperate to actually get out of this mess um, and that's all for me thank you, thank you.